Ora oh, si sente meglio? Sì, ma no, qua si sente ora? Si sente o non si sente? Sì, si sente. Okay, so uh, the last talk of this uh, afternoon session will be given by Giuseppe Mingioni in Spanish Rosario, right. <laughs> who has been working for years in uh, nonlinear elliptic and parabolic equations in Calderon Sigmund theory, and he will explain here the relation of these tools with fractional operators. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Juan Luis. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, in, uh, inviting me. As you notice, the title has slightly changed because uh, uh, there's now something added in parentheses that is and vice versa. Uh, actually, because what I'm, what I'm planning to do in this talk is first, uh, okay, it's actually describing a double play interaction. Because the usual interaction uh, we have seen over the last years, where there was somehow an explosion of, uh, of um, uh, fractional problems, has been um, uh, taking nonlinear and, uh, and even linear, even linear methods from local problems. And uh, we have uh, very often seen uh, translation and a far-reaching extension to the no-local setting. And uh, sometimes think, things can be quite different, as we are going to see today. Uh, but uh, also, I'd like to, to discover a wide range of methods that are actually no-local methods. Methods that can be actually applied to local classical problems. Classical, nonlinear, uh, local problems. And uh, so what I'm planning to do is to show a double interplay uh, to see how nonlinear classical methods can be applied to the fractional setting, but also how uh, f uh, the, 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 let's say some fractional methods can be applied to nonlinear methods. Okay, um, uh, as far as uh, fractional results um, uh, are concerned, uh, I'll be presenting some results with uh, uh, Tomo Kuusi and Yang Xir, fractional results. And uh, these are essentially in the first part, where we extend nonlinear methods and nonlinear ideas to the fractional setting to solve some fractional problems, while I will also present some other results where fractional methods, um, where actually um, no local methods can be applied to do some no local problems. And uh, okay, as far as the first part is concerned, let me start from uh, nonlinear potential theory. Potential theory. Okay, what is nonlinear potential theory about is actually a, a far reaching extension of the classical linear potential theory. The classical linear potential theory is dealing with the solutions of these problems in Rn larger than 2. And uh, it's essentially dealing, it, it also in somehow incorporates classical Calderon Sigmund theory. And the idea is that we want to study as much as possible the regularity properties of solutions and of their derivatives in terms of the regularity of the assigned data. This is given. Okay, that's a classical way to do this. And the classical way is going via representation formulas. Representation formulas are telling you that you can represent uh, this via convolution with the classical Green's function. And the classical Green's function is the following. This is 1 over x minus y, n minus 2, if n is larger than 2. Otherwise, it's minus log 
x if n is equal to 2, and this is up to a constant, up to a universal constant. Once you have this, once you have this, uh, then essentially everything is known concerning, uh, concerning u and its derivatives. As far as u is concerned, you get uh, the first estimate via risk potential, i1 of x, which is defined in the following way. And this is the classical risk potential. This is for n larger than 2. Otherwise, you always have this, actually, this representation. And actually, this estimate up to a constant, of course, um, we had the i2 risk potential. Uh, this is i2. And the, we had the i1 risk potential, which is the following one. Now, since the behavior, the behavior of these operators is known in essentially all reasonable function spaces, then you can reconstruct via this inequality, at least, for instance, all the integrability properties in any reasonable uh, function space, like, for instance, rearrangement invariant function spaces, uh, Lebesgue spaces, Orlitz, uh, Lorentz, whatever you like. Okay, this is the classical fact, this is the classical world, but the classical world rests on this representation formula, which is very much linked to the, to the fact that you have this equation, and actually you have a linear equation. This is the classical approach, and if you want to push it further up to the second derivatives, then this becomes the classical calderon zygmunt theory, where, uh, let's say, Young's type inequality are not sufficient anymore, and then you go to cancellations and uh, to, to singular integrals. But anyway, as I was telling before, this is the linear world, so you have a fundamental solution, and this motivated, for instance, in the 60s or in the 70s, a great deal of studies with all the, the, the things related to, to fundamental solutions and microlocal analysis and blah, blah. Uh, now, what, uh, what is nonlinear potential theory about is actually uh, the idea that you want to extend as much as possible the validity of this approach without having fundamental solutions, of course, to the nonlinear setting. And in the nonlinear setting, we are considering quasi linear equations of this type equals to mu, where this is in the most general case a measure. Uh, and um, but let's, let's say that we are just talking about a priori estimates because uh, defining solutions for measure data, uh, it's a bit problematic. You have to go to approximation methods. But anyway, uh, the idea is that we talk about, uh, uh, we, we treat this as a measure, but let's imagine it's a same infinity function and then we get uh, uh, suitable a priori estimates, which is just depending on the fact that on the total variation of the measure, that for simplicity we imagine to be finite. Okay, so the first idea, we want to extend this to the linear setting, and the linear setting means that we are considering Poisson type, nonlinear Poisson type equations. This means that this has a linear growth, and the ellipticity is prescribed by saying that you have this control from below on the, on the, on the eigenvalues for every lambda uh, in our n. And uh, furthermore, you also prescribe that you have uh, this control on the largest eigenvalue. So this means that the ratio between the highest and the lowest eigenvalue of this, of the, of the matrix A of X is L over U, and this is, uh, this is ellipticity. Furthermore, you want, to go, uh, you want to go on and you want to consider possibly the generator operator, so Pilaplacian type, where the model case is the following one. And you get this operator, which is still uniformly elliptic because the ratio between the, eigen, the highest and the lowest eigenvalue is uniformly bounded, but this, can, this time can be possibly degenerate. And uh, more generally, we shall consider, um, we shall consider uh, the classical Lagishensky and Duralsev assumptions on the equations like this that are modeled on this case. That are modeled on this case, this means that now, when we consider the growth conditions, these this ones, this will be bounded by z to the p minus 1, which certainly happens for this special operator. And the ellipticity is uh, described in the following way. Here it's lambda square, because you have to have something elliptic. But now you have a degeneration factor, which is this one. Of course, these assumptions reduce to this for p equals to 2, as well as the Laplacian reduces 
to the classical, as the P Laplacian reduces to the classical Laplacian for P equals to 2. Yeah. And? No? Um, yes, sure. Thanks. Okay. Okay, this is the general setting. So in the first part of the talk, I will first give a summary of how we surprisingly can extend these two estimates to the general setting, which is quite non-trivial because you do not have a fundamental solution so that at the first side appears to be an absolutely, uh, um, I mean, um, uh, an absolutely uh, crucial way to get such bounds. And then we see how this can be extended to the, to the classical, uh, uh, to the new fractional setting, and this is the first of the papers that I'm talking about uh, here, written with Tuomo and Yannick, and then we will see how other, um, let's say, classical nonlinear tools can be extended to the fractional setting. Now I'm going to switch to slides, otherwise the talk will take three hours. Okay. Huh? Oh. Okay, as I told you, I'm going to switch to slides. And uh, okay, uh, first, now the new, uh, the, new, uh, the new goal, the first goal, is to extend these two inequalities to the nonlinear setting where I'm considering, well, you can keep in mind this special operator, but all the results are actually holding for this most general class of Lagishinsky and Ryazeva type operators. Okay, this is the first part. First, let me rewrite the risk potential in a way which is suitable to localize the estimates. This, there is no cheating here. This is a total triviality. I'm introducing here what is called uh, uh, the truncated risk potential, which is just another way of writing the classical risk potential. You make a usual, okay, you, may, you, you can do this in very many ways. Um, maybe uh, decomposition in annuli would work. Anyway, from now on, this is just the risk potential. We talk about risk potential and we think of this, of the truncated or localized risk potential. Okay, now the point is that if you look at this operator, let's say the P Laplacian type operator, you immediately see that when P is different than two, for instance, these estimates just cannot hold because they do not respect the scaling of the equation. If you get a, an estimate that doesn't scale as the equation, then the estimate is wrong because you do a scaling and you see that the, all solutions are trivial. This means that the estimate cannot be true. So in, when P is different in two, the standard orthodoxy in the linear potential theory is to use this Wolf type potential. This is nothing but the classical risk potential that now incorporates the deficit scaling of this equation because you see that when this k is like P minus one, this k is like one, so introduce so you want, to introduce the, you want to introduce the scaling, and then you create this new potential. This, um, for p equals to 2, not surprisingly, reduces to the classical risk potential. So the orthodoxy nonlinear potential theory is that whenever you have a degenerate operator and p is different than 2, then you go to this booth potential and you try to adapt the results. And the first very, uh, very nice result is due to Kilpelangen and Mali then uh, they proved that for this operator, and actually for any operator satisfying these assumptions, but even, even further, actually, then you can pointwise estimate u by the booth potential W1P plus this object. The real point is this one, because this is the localization object, which is there, which must be there when mu is equal to zero, which is there. Otherwise, you let capital R goes to zero. This goes to zero because it's an integral and then you get u less than or equal than u. Otherwise, if you want to be on the whole RN, then you let capital I goes to plus infinity, and this object disappears, and then you get the booth potential. This is done by a clever application of, uh, of a variation of uh, truncation methods uh, of uh, the judge in the setting of measured data problems. Okay, now, um, what about, and this is essentially uh, the analog of the first result. Then after this, it remained an open problem to get uh, the analog of the second result. The analog of the second result um, uh, is actually much more uh, delicate. Uh, just for instance, for one reason that you can immediately see. How do you get gradient estimate on an equation like this? You differentiate the equation. You differentiate the equation, this means that you have to handle with some quantities that are second derivatives. 
Now, let's consider just the case P equal to two, and let me consider the case when you have Poisson equation equal to mu, then second derivatives do not exist because this is the classical failure of calderon zygmunt theory in the, in the limiting case, just for instance, already when this is in L1. So therefore, this means that the classical techniques cannot be applied because you do not have even a starting point. You cannot differentiate the equation. So this problem remained open for 20 years, and uh, just let me say that, um, uh, that the first result appeared in, uh, in a paper of mine, um, and essentially this tells you that there is no difference from, from, from the linear case to the nonlinear case, because here the real point is the jump from the linear case where you can use fundamental solutions to the nonlinear case where fundamental solutions are not available, or at least they are available, but of course you cannot get general solutions via convolution. You can always define fundamental solutions formally by solving uh, when the right, something when the right hand side is a Dirac, but then you don't do anything else with that. Okay, um, actually, I'll, I'll try to come back uh, to this later on. Uh, um, essentially, when you are on the whole Rn, or when you have a suitable decay at infinity of the gradient, which is satisfied, then you get the usual estimate, and this is uh, uh, a quite satisfying result because there's, the, there's no difference between the, the Laplacian and any other quasi linear, nonlinear operator. Okay. What about p different in two? Uh, the case p different in two, then uh, 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 following the standard orthodoxy, you look for a Wolf potential. Wolf potentials are good because they can be anyway controlled via this inequality by iterations of risk potentials. Once you have this, uh, actually this is a, a, a pointwise uh, uh, equivalence, when, at least for p larger than two minus one over n, the right hand side guy is called having Mazia potential, and this is proved in a classical paper by having a Mazia from 71. Anyway, this is telling you that whenever you have Wolf potentials, your job is done because this can be controlled by risk potentials and the behavior of risk potentials is well known. Okay, so let me go back to the case P different in two, and the, the first result was achieved by Frank Duser and myself, and this tells you exactly what you would expect following the standard orthodoxy. Following the standard orthodoxy, now you can pointwise bound the gradient via the Wolf potential, and this is actually um, quite satisfying estimate because this allows you to get all the classical estimates that you get via fundamental solutions uh, by Wolf potentials. This is uh, this guy, and it, as you can see for p equals to 2, this reduces to i1, so you get back this estimate and the previous estimate one. But now let me make a twist because uh, when you find the estimate, you do not want to follow the standard orthodoxy, that is what the society is telling you, but you want to follow just the equation. It's the equation that is telling you what, is, what you're talking about. So what you're doing when you're doing Calder and Sigmund theory? What you're doing when you're doing Calder and Sigmund theory, um, you know that by Calder and Sigmund theory, and this is actually the Laplacian, well, uh, when you have such an equation, when you have such an equation, and mu, for instance, belongs to LQ, for q larger than one, then this implies that the second derivatives are in LQ, as long as q is not equal to plus infinity. So this means that you are making a trade between the divergence operator and the derivative. So you're making this trade, and this belongs to LQ, like this one. Now let's make, let's believe in the power of, uh, of regularity, and uh, let's discuss what happens when you deal with the P-Laplacian equation. When you're dealing with the P-Laplacian equation, then you're dealing with such an equation. And now let's make a trade. Let's treat this as it would be a, something uh, which is, let's say, a derivative. So let me decompose this as this and this is equal to this. Now uh, the point is that you can always, this is not an elliptic operator, so you cannot get a priori estimates, but you can solve this. And the classical solution tells you that you can bound, let's say, the, deriv uh, the derivatives of B via mu, and the formal, if you apply I1 to both sides, I1 is an integration, so it should cancel the divergence, and this means that uh, this, is, uh, this is giving you that this should be less than or equal than the, 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 the I1 risk potential. So the equation, you're just applying I1 to both sides. I1 cancels the divergence, and then you get formally this. So the equation is telling you 
that uh, although the that uh, okay, uh, the equation is telling you well, I'm nonlinear. I'm a, I'm a nonlinear equation in the gradient, but I'm a linear. I'm a linear equation in, in the flux, in the in, in the in the in the whole tensor. So the equation is telling you that this is the estimate that should hold. So actually, also when p different than two, you should be able to bound the gradient pointwise via Ries potential rather than Wolf potential. Um, this, is, this appears at the first sight as a crazy, uh, as a crazy heuristic argument, but it's actually true because what the equation is telling you is exactly this. And this was proved by, uh, by Tomokusi and myself a few years ago. So this result uh, that tells uh, for uh, that tells that uh, that actually holds for general operators and for more general than the P-Laplacian, for instance. Uh, having any elliptic operator under the divergence form, and this is a non-trivial work of Bayoni. Uh, well, this equation, um, this result allows you to, um, to, in a certain sense, linearize the whole theory of the P-Laplacian, because now, whenever you want to prove on the gradient of the P-Laplacian, it can be proved exactly as it were the Laplacian, and this holds for general operators. So this is a general result that, in other words, incorporates all the results, all the regularity results given by the previous theories. For instance, the theories of Boccardo and Galois uh, for measure data problems is implied by this. The classical estimates by Di Benedetto, Manfredi, and Divanez are implied by this. Even the classical estimates by Talenti can be recovered by this. Uh, this holds for p larger than 2 minus 1 over n at the moment, but there, uh, there could be improvements I'll for that, yeah. Yeah, but let, let me concentrate just on the case p larger or equal than 2, because, yeah. Okay. And uh, essentially, when you are on the whole Rn, you have the classical estimate that now holds for any general possible solution to this equation. Okay, now let me go to the non-local, non-linear potential theory, and let me present a few extensions to these to non-local problems. Okay, the extensions to non-local problem. Let me start uh, uh, step by step uh, by the classical uh, fractional Laplacian, which in a distributional way, it's, uh, it's defined as this one. So this is the analog of this equation. So at the moment, this is the analog of this equation. And this is the nice equation that can be solved via Fourier transform, because uh, essentially you have a kernel whose Fourier transform is perfectly known, and then you can do whatever with this. So this is the analog of this equation. So you see the kernel is this object. It's 1 over x minus uh, uh, y n plus 2, uh, 12. Uh, then we switch to a general kernel. And now you still have something which is linear with respect to the solution, but you lose the perfect shape of the kernel, and you replace it by two bounds that replicates the growth. This is the analog of this equation with measurable coefficients. So essentially, the first thing you would like to do is, for instance, extending the classical De Georgi Nash Moser theory to such equations. Uh, then we go to the quasi linear case. We, we have now something which involves a measurable kernel, as before, but now incorporates a nonlinearity uh, non uh, with respect to the u variable, but this nonlinearity is qualified because it's a monotone. This is monotonicity. Essentially, this is the ellipticity of the phi. And these are the analog of these equations. And then we go even further. We, take, uh, we go to the p range. And now we, uh, we produce ellipticity at the p level. And we take p level. And now this is, a this is the non-local analog of the classical p Laplacian operator. So we have produced the reproduction, the fractional version of the Laplacian, then of linear equations with measurable coefficients, non-linear equations with measurable coefficients, and degenerate equations with measurable coefficients. So these are the three cases. Uh, uh, essentially, the prototype is the following one, where the non-linearity is very much explicit in this way. And this essentially, the operator on the left-hand side is known as the uh, fractional p Laplacian. And the fractional p Laplacian uh, essentially emerges when you want to minimize this norm with respect to this kernel. So it's a natural object because you're minimizing the p norm. You're minimizing p norm. Uh, so uh, and now you remember that the, the first estimate of Kirpelang and Mali tells you that you can locally bound this guy 
the W1U, X, R, where W1P mu X, R is equal to this. Plus the localization term, the unavoidable localization term, which is this one. Yeah. So this is the classical estimate of Kilpelangen and Mali. Uh, okay, now we want to reproduce est uh, an estimate of this type uh, for the fractional P Laplacian, and in particular, we consider problems of this type and the, uh, the, the, the natural assumptions that must be prescribed due to the no locality of the operator on the whole Rn because there are long range interactions and essentially the boundary can be P capacity zero in several cases, right? If P is too small. And, uh, uh, and uh, the natural space is the space where this object called the tail of the function is, uh, is considered to be in this space. So this is the essentially the right space, because this is the, uh, essentially this is a quantity that uh, uh, is nothing fancy, but uh, it's uh, the explicit quantity that emerges whenever you try to have energy estimates for this equation. So you always have this quantity popping up everywhere, so you prescribe that this quantity is finite, otherwise you cannot deal with anything, and this is the minimal condition for which you can handle your equation. Uh, um, so this is the tail, and uh, essentially, uh, in fact, there's a beautiful estimate by Di Castro, Gussi, and Palatucci that tells you that if you have such a solution, then you have the classical object plus the tail that takes into account the long-range interactions uh, of, the, uh, of the solution of all the points. So it is obvious that our estimate, if there's an estimate, if there's a potential estimate, so if there's a potential... So if that's a potential estimate, uh, uh, the potential estimate must incorporate also the tail. Uh, um, actually, let me make a, a brief sketch of the regularity for this Peter Laplacian type operator and the status for the, this, uh, the, this nonlinear operator. Uh, uh, there's a beautiful theory by Di Castro, Gussi, and Palatucci that also extends previous theory by Kassman, where um, uh, a full theory is... Uh, is um, is presented uh, and uh, uh, the superestimate, the Helder continuity, and even Ang and King equalities are proved uh, for, uh, for solutions to these problems. Then there's a more recent beautiful paper by Kotzi where he extends this in a variational setting. So the good, uh, the good thing of this paper is that uh, um, the, the paper is given for, uh, for minimizers of functionals, for minimizers of post potentially non-differentiable non functionals, because the functional f can be, for instance, just elder continuous. So this means that you want to get regularity information not from the all Lagrange equation that could not exist at this stage, but directly from minimality. In other words, from minimality, as in the classical case, it is possible to derive uh, Cacciopoli or energy type inequalities, and from these inequalities, then you get regularity. This is what Kotzi does, and this is the reproduction of the classical Jacquinton Juicy's theory of regularity, where they prove, for instance, that any minimizer of this functional with just p growth, so without uh, assuming that uh, there's um, um, that there is a uh, that there is all a Lagrange equation are held or continuous and locally held or continuous, involving also hierarchy inequalities. And um, this is the classical approach. And um, as far as the higher gradient theory is concerned, this is very much open because differentiating something which is already fractional it turns out to be difficult. There are a few, uh, a few results by Brasco and Lindgren, which are recent, but uh, the higher order, order regularity is still an open issue. Okay, uh, let me just, okay, you can, please, you can also completely forget about this, this, uh, this slide, uh, because I'm just getting, uh, uh, I'm just giving you the, the definition of solutions to measure data problems. So essentially, uh, you have uh, now the P-Laplacian type operator on the left-hand side, you want to solve with a mu, and you do it with approximation. This is what you classically do in the local case. In the local case, when you have a measured data problem, like, for instance, this one, The classical issue is very simple. You can first define very weak solutions or distributional solutions, and these are just distributional solutions to this one. This you can always, uh, you can always define in the classical case, 
And uh, in the classical case, uh, you get uh, that a solution to a measure that a problem, a very weak solution, solves in the, in the weak form this, this, this identity. If you are in Omega. So uh, if, you, if you think of the P Laplacian, if you want to give sense to this, where the distribution of solution prescribed that this is infinity, then you just require that this is L1, which is the same than thinking that this is in LP1, minus one. So you are not in the natural energy space associated to the operator. So these solutions are natural, but these solutions are absolutely unmanageable. You cannot do anything with them, essentially, because you cannot get energy estimates. You cannot, for instance, test with something which is proportional to you. So these are not good. Essentially, no one is able to handle with them. So what you do, you define special classes of solutions to measure data problems. So you do the most natural thing. You smooth it out the measure in a way or in another. So in a way that this has become, for instance, L infinity. You consider approximating solutions. And then you pass to the limit provided that you have good a priori estimates. Now you can have good a priori estimates because you can test this. You can test this, and then you can pass to the limit. So the same thing is done in the local case, uh, in the no local case. But you can just forget, and uh, you can uh, think that you have now the good, so the, the good definition in your pocket. OK, so the, the main result with, uh, with Tuomo and Yannick is the following one. You have exactly, you have exactly uh, the, po the potential estimate that now incorporates exactly the term you are waiting for. You were waiting for. So you have uh, the Wolf potential bound, which is now not n minus p, but n minus p alpha, because it must respect the scaling of the equation. You see that if alpha is very small then you have less regularity properties of the R operator. And in fact, the, uh, the, the potential becomes worse. Yeah? When alpha is very small, you get a, a strong singularities. And this reflects that uh, you have less regularization properties of your operator. When alpha gets larger, you get better and better. So you get the term you would expect, the localization term, plus the tail. When mu is equal to 0, this, is, uh, this gives you back the superestimate before. Moreover, uh, this also involves a, a classical, um, a classical um, a criterion on fine regularities of solution, because whenever you have that your Wolf potential is finite, then you have a Lebesgue point. This is classical in um, a classical linear theory or uh, pot linear potential theory, right? The, the, the real, uh, the, one of the first historical uh, uh, um, goals of linear potential theory was to study the fine properties of solutions of Poisson type equations via potentials. Now you know that potential is finite, you have a precise representative, and then you have the, the you can estimate the capacities of the and the, capaci the capacity of the singular sets and the fine properties and whatever. Essentially, this is the result, and this is the perfect analog of the result of Kilpelangen and Mali, which is this one. And you see uh, the Wolf potential uh, W alpha P is the, is the following one. OK, so as far as the gradient theory, this is still open. So this is the first uh, adaptation okay, to, the, uh, to, the, 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 um, to the no local setting of a, a classical local uh, nonlinear result. So this follows the lines and extends in the way you expect uh, something which is established in the nonlinear case. Now I will present, uh, and uh, by the way, you can have also, for instance, criterion that if you have that mu is in this special Lorentz space, then the solution is continuous. This is the borderline uh, optimal space you would expect, and so forth. This is implied by our results, for instance. You have uh, that if the Wolf potentials goes to zero uniformly, then the solution is continuous. This is essentially a byproduct of the previous proof, because the previous proof also tells you that you have a, a, a precise representative if the, the Wolf potential is finite. If this goes to zero uniformly, then this means that the measure is not spreading, is spreading enough to uh, guarantee the, the, the absence of singularities and the final continuity and so forth. You can get estimates like this. Uh, the definition of Lorentz space is this one. They are interpolating spaces. Uh, they are interpolating the big spaces. And they are able to catch the, let's say, the, the final borderline results. 
Okay, this was the fine, uh, first extension uh, that, uh, uh, let's say, it's a first type of extension. It replicates a local result. Now I'd like to present a second like, fractional result that does not replicate a linear result, essentially where there's a new phenomenon coming up. And this is a non-local self-improving property. Uh, the non-local self-improving property uh, uh, has something to do with the so-called uh, Myers estimate. So Myers estimates are the following one. Uh, what can you tell about uh, already, for instance, in the case P equals to 2 and the right-hand side equal to 0, what can you tell about the regularity of the gradient and the integrability of the gradient uh, of an equation like this. To take uh, uh, already when the right hand side is equal to zero and you start from an energy solutions, now you are considering the case P equals to two in these assumptions, in the assumptions before. Okay, uh, then the classical uh, Elkert Myers and Jaquinta Modica's um, estimates are the following one. This bootstraps into something which is better uh, then L2, for some small delta depending only on the ellipticity constants of the equation. Uh, this is the so-called higher integrability. It's classically proved by Myers using Calder and Sigmund theory. Now there's a, a better approach due to Gehring, uh, Gehring's lemma. Gehring's lemma tells you the following. Assume that you have a so-called reverse Hilder inequality. Reverse Hilder inequality is the following one. You take F, just consider G to be zero at the moment. The classical Hilder uh, inequality tells you that this inequality is true if Q is larger than P. Now assume that Q is less than P. So you reverse the principle of Hilder's inequality. Then this improves, uh, this self-improves the integrability of the function, getting you another exponent for which you get better and better. As long as the right-hand side allows you, which is a source term in this, in this setting. Okay, uh, the point is that uh, for these equations, you have uh, what is classically called uh, uh, the Cacioppoli type inequality, also called the reverse Poincare inequality or energy estimate. So you can, uh, you can bound for ellipticity the gradient by the solution itself. So you can bound a higher order object by a lower order object. And this is according to the principle that, for instance, for harmonic functions, pointwise convergence, bootstrapping, uniform convergence in all derivatives, right? So you can control higher order objects with lower order ones. This you can prove under these assumptions, and this implies the higher integrability of the gradient. So let's see how this implies the higher integrability of the gradient. This is a very simple inequality that you can easily obtain by testing with the simplest possible choice of the, in the equation. So you take a cutoff feet and you multiply by u and you test it and then you get it in two lines. Okay, um, so how do you get this one? So you get that the gradient can be estimated by this. Now apply Poincaré's inequality for the right-hand side, and you get what? A reverse Hilder inequality. Because now you can bound du squared by du squared to a lower power, which is n over n plus 2. Now you can conclude with the non-trivial Gehring's lemma, getting you that, uh, that you self-improve the gradient. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a very simple fact. So you get, a, you get an elliptic equation, you get a Cacioppoli type inequality, so you can control the u by u, but u can be controlled by a lower power of the gradient, and then you self-improve, concluding by Gehring's lemma. Okay, um, so this is the improvement. What can you tell about now the oscillations of the gradient? You can actually tell nothing, and this is the counterexample. Take the simplest possible elliptic equation, this is the solution, Take uh, 1 over AT to be measurable, just measurable, and you see that the gradient of the solution is 1 over AT, and so AT can be as bad as you like, and so there's no improvement whatsoever. End of the story. So in the local case, you get an improvement of the integrability, but no matter you can do, you cannot get this. And this happens when coefficients are bad, bad coefficients, bad coefficients. Okay. Now, uh, now we go to the, to, now we want to extend this improve, self-improving result to the no-local case. And we go to the, to the, um, to this uh, very simple setting, to the linear setting, but with measurable coefficients. 
So you just get a lower and upper bound on the kernel uh, K, and this doesn't allow you to use Fourier transform because you don't know exactly the, the specific shape of K. Uh, so the analog, okay, uh, what is the definition of energy solution? You are in W alpha P, alpha 2. I will not recall, at least in this conference, the definition of the fractional subtle space. So please allow me to not, in this conference, re, uh, recall the definition of Sobolev's Lobodevsky space. So the, the natural definition you want to start with, and which is the natural analog of the energy, the, uh, of the energy solution, which is in W12, in the local case, is W alpha 2. And if you want to, to extend what you, get, uh, what, you, what you get in the linear case, you are, you are led to, to assume that U is in W alpha 2 plus delta for some, some delta. So this is the Myers property in this case. Um, and let me recall you that this is uh, essentially the, 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 this norm. Okay, this is essentially what you have because Bass and Rand, they proved uh, that this is true. And essentially, this relies on the classical scheme. You get uh, uh, reversal the inequality, and then you get, uh, you get that these quantities in L2 plus delta, and this implies by a characterization of Stein and Strickerts that this is in W alpha 2 plus delta. But the surprise is that now there's a new unexpected phenomenon, is that uh, uh, what you can actually prove is that you do not only have a self-improvement of integrability, but you have a self-improvement of, uh, of differentiability. And this is, a, uh, this is one of the very few cases of, uh, of, uh, of a purely non-local uh, no effect. So this is not true in the local case. So this is not the replication of the, lo of the, of the local result. This is a new phenomenon. And the proof of this is very highly non-trivial. It involves essentially 30, 30 pages of uh, hard harmonic analysis. When I say hard harmonic analysis, this means that you are not using the tools, uh, the, the pre-made tools of harmonic analysis, but you really have to do coverings and uh, combinatorics and uh, things like that. So you have to do really things by hands. So you have to use uh, ideas from harmonic analysis, but not tools. And there is no analog of that. Uh, later on, Shikora was able to extend this by saying that if you prove, a, if you go a bit below, then you can go a bit further on. Um, there's a difference between this result. Uh, essentially, you can get also this result by, by the methods that, uh, by, by adapting some, uh, some of our methods. Our methods start from energy inequalities. Uh, these methods uh, require solutions. In fact, we do everything by hand. Shikora, in, a very, in this very nice paper, has used uh, delicate properties of commutators in fractional spaces. All the things extend to the, P, uh, to, the P, to the P case. Okay, let me now present our approach. And it's a fractional approach to Gering Lemma. Uh, um, uh, the fractional approach has one advantage. For instance, if you want to consider minimizers of functionals, for which you do not have Euler Lagrange equations, then you can use this approach. You cannot use the approach via testing because you do not have the equation. So, for instance, uh, I, 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 um, uh, I think that this could follow in the, in, the realm, in the realm of this paper of Kotzi and blah, blah. Okay, so uh, just two, two slides because the proof is. Okay. Uh, okay, what is the starting point, as I told you? The starting point is this Cacioppoli type inequality in the local case. Then from this, you get the reversal of the inequalities, and then you conclude via Gehring's lemma. Okay, now the first, our first approach is that we prove an energy type inequality. You see, on the left-hand side, you have the, the alpha derivative dimensionally. On the right-hand side, you have the same thing before, scaling proportionally. And then you, can, you take a tail type term, which, is, which takes into account the fact that the problem means it's on the whole Rn and involves the long range interactions between points and, and functions. And then we prove that if you have this inequality, then you have this. So just this fractional Cacioppoli type inequality implies the higher differentiability. Actually, it is sufficient to prove higher differentiability because then by embedding, you know that from higher differentiability, you also get intermediate differentiability and integrability. Okay, so what does it mean that U is in W12?
being W12 means that uh, trivially du is integrable with respect to a finite measure. So the idea is that where is this additional differentiability coming from? Now, what does it mean that u be belongs to W alpha 2? This means that this object, which is dimensionally speaking analysis to the gradient, uh, but you know that there is a no local effect here, uh, well, this is integrable against an infinite set function. So this should improve. This should tell you that this object is, in a way, better than the other. So this is actually the source of this extra differentiability. Because this object, there must, this object must be smaller than what you believe, because it must be integrable against something which is not finally integrable. Uh, how this, this connects from L1? This is a, a Marcinkiewicz factor. It's a log factor. So this means that if this is finite against something that blows up as a log, this should be better of a log type. But you, whenever you get a log in higher integrability, then you can improve and bootstrap to a power. This is the first proof, the first unknown proof of Gehring's lemma. The first unknown proof was getting first a log integrability, and then you bootstrap to a power. So this is the first suspect that should be something. So the idea is the following one. We make this, uh, uh, this measure finite. But making this measure finite means that you, we do n minus epsilon. And we do, we do something here. Now this is finite against this. So we lift the problem into Rn times Rn. And we say that this function is finite against this measure. So the measure is, is, uh, is, is more regular as the object, too. Because you, see, you, you trade the blow up of the measure, you trade it in the denominator. But trading in the denominator means improving differentiability. So we translate the Cacioppoli typing equality, a reverse order inequality for the lifted function capital U. We prove a version of Gehring's lemma for dual pairs, for these new dual pairs. We call them dual, dual pairs in this sense. Then the higher integrability of capital U translates into a higher differentiability of U. Let's see why. Assume that U is in L2 plus log. What does this mean? This, this, but this means this. So this is a way to exploit the thing. And in fact, what we prove is the following one. The previous the, if you get this, for this dual pair, this inequality, then this inequality self-improves. Now, this, at the first sight, might appear as a, one of the many generalizations of the, of, the, of the Gehring's lemma. But in fact, it is not. Why? Because the tilde b, which are, are the product of balls. This means that uh, if this is Rn times Rn, while Gehring's lemma would require an information on every possible ball, here you only, only have balls around the diagonal and complete loss of information outside. So the idea is that you have a, a very difficult trade between the distance from the diagonal where you lose information and where you get information. The idea is that uh, you have to quantify the distance from the diagonal. If the distance is far enough, then you are good because the kernel is not bad. If you are close enough, you have information. And then this makes a, uh, the combinatorics very, very delicate. OK. And now part four. Briefly, very briefly, I'll go now in the other direction of the talk. Let's say our fractional methods, and this is probably less known to the audience, how fractional methods can be extended to local, to, to can be used to, to get a local results. So first of all, a first example, limiting Calder and Zygmunt theory. As I told you, if you have a measure data equation, and now this is a local fact, for instance, you have this model equation, what do you have? The classical theory is that tells you that uh, the gradient is in this space, and this is sharp. This is already sharp for the case p equals to 2. Otherwise, it can be seen to be sharp if you see the classical nonlinear Green's function, which is this one.
Magnus. Ah, sorry. Yeeps. <laughs> Okay, this is the classical nonlinear screens function. Okay, uh, now there's a gap because you know you cannot get that the gradient is in W11. This is the, once again the failure of Calder and Sigmund theory in the limiting case. So you get that uh, there is a lack of, of theory. Why? Because uh, you have uh, a second order equation. A second order equation is something that formally prescribes the value of second derivatives. But now you have all the information about first derivatives, so you would like to lift it up. Uh, okay, this was done for the case P equals 2, 2 by me several years ago, where I proved that if the gradient cannot be in W11, uh, this uh, is uh, anyway in every subble of space before W11. So you almost lose nothing. Uh, this is a... a, a um, um, uh, a special technique that allows uh, to get a sort of um, analog of local little pallet decomposition. So this is for the gradient. Uh, what happens when P is different in two? Well, analyzing uh, the behavior of the fundamental solution, this would lead to the idea that the gradient must be in this space. And in fact, this is also true. This is sharp as because this embeds into a sobble of space. If you pay, take epsilon equal to zero, this would embed in a, in a Lebesgue space where the fundamental solution is not, doesn't belong to. And uh, essentially, this paper lifted the, the whole theory up to the differentiability level. So this is the first case of limiting Calder and Sigmund theory. But now, uh, essentially, as I, as I explained before, as I explained before, uh, the, the whole essence of Calder and Sigmund theory is that when you have a regularizing operator, you can trade, for instance, in this case, or in the more general case, provided the regularity assumption on the vector field A are considered, you can trade this with the divergence, divergence with the gradient. So this is formally telling you that the derivative of the whole, the derivatives of the whole object should belong to a good subular space, as in the case of the Laplacian. So in the Laplacian, you have that uh, you can trade the divergence with the derivatives. And uh, this is what has been done in a recent paper by uh, Abel Incusi and myself. So we can essentially trading the divergence with the derivatives, uh, getting the limiting, the full limiting regularity of, uh, let's say, getting the, the limiting case of Calder and Sigmund theory in the nonlinear case. Uh, this is a delicate result that couples with the previous result. The previous result, that is the potential estimate, states that you can control essentially A of the U with I1 of mu x plus A of the U. So it's all intrinsic. So in the, in, the, in the previous case, you apply I1 to both sides and you get this estimate. In this case, you get, you get the, 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 the Calder and Zygmunt analog. So this is the potential estimate analog, while this is the Calder and Zygmunt analog. OK, and uh, this comes along with the suitable Cacciopoli type inequality, which is explicit. Observe that in the case uh, mu equal to zero, you get actually the derivatives of A and you can estimate. Okay. And um, let me give the final example. And this is probably surprising because actually uh, we know from the uh, initial paper of Caffarelli and Vasseur and Kassman that uh, the fractional de Giorgi technique has been used to prove, uh, to prove uh, that there's a, a fractional de Giorgi technique uh, used to prove regularity for solutions to fractional operators. Uh, uh, actually, um, there's another paper where I introduced a similar fractional de Giorgi technique to prove essentially regularity for solutions to local operators. Uh, what is the difference? The difference is the following one. So I'll give the first proof of the gradient potential estimate for P equals 2, 2. I'll give the proof of this estimate. 
And so this shows essentially the interplay I was talking about uh, at the beginning of the talk. So the interplay between fractional and local, uh, between not only results, but also between methods. Uh, OK, this is the first proof of this result, and it's the following one. OK, how do you get a gradient estimate when mu is equal to 0? So how do you usually get the usual gradient estimate for a solution, which is the following one? You get that the u is less than or equal than its average. This is classical for harmonic functions. OK, uh, you take a solution of this guy. You differentiate the equation, as I was telling before. So the gradient becomes the solution to a linearized equation with measurable coefficients. And actually, this is the core of the George's theory. And then you get that du is bounded. How do you get, in turn, the bound for du? By writing a fractional Cacciopoli equality on level sets. The second derivative, because now it's the gradient to be a solution, can be bounded by first derivatives. And then you can use Sobolev embedding theorem to get a linear a nonlinear iteration, eventually leading to the bound for the gradient. So this is the classical approach. Now, in the classical fractional problems, for instance, if we follow this, the, these papers uh, that I mentioned before, you, what you get, you cannot get the higher differentiability. You cannot get such a fractional Cacciopoli inequality. Uh, two, three minutes. Yeah, it's, oh, it's almost done. It's almost done. OK. Um, now, the point is the following one. So in the classical, when you deal with fractional problems, you, do not, you don't have local derivatives, so you cannot even write them. Here, you have derivatives, but you cannot once again write them. Not because the problem is not local, but because the problem involves a measure. If the problem involves a measure, then this program fails from the very beginning. Because uh, if this is a measure, or even if this is in L1, then the second derivatives are not in L1. So how do you replace this method? Um, by recalling that this is the Gallardo norm of the, of the function d, what you get is the, the following. You recover the theorem I was talking about before. And, uh, and actually, what you do, you prove a fractional Cacciopoli type inequality. So you don't have, uh, so the idea is that although the problem is local, there are no second derivatives because the right hand side is bad. But there are fractional derivatives. So you can write a, a fractional Cacciopoli type inequality where you bound not the second derivatives of the solutions, but the fractional derivative of the solution, plus the remaining part, which is due to a non-trivial right-hand side. This is essentially the, the same approach that comes from, uh, from, uh, uh, from the papers that I mentioned before by Caffarelli, Vassero, and Kassman, and was done also independently here. But there, the, the, the heavy fact comes later on because you have the tail term, terms to control, while the fractional Cacciopoli type inequality comes for free one line, just by testing. Here, the point, the very delicate point, is deriving a non-local fractional Cacciopoli inequality because the problem is local and forces things to be local. Here, you want to go down. And this is essentially the, the Littlewood Paley decomposition type method that I was mentioning before. Anyway, you can prove this where you get some sigma. You don't care how large sigma is, because the iteration in the George's nash mosler theory are geometric. So whenever sigma is larger than 0, you are finally converging. So this is the first result I proved in this paper, which was actually written in 2007. And then the second result, uh, you see, compare the classical Cacciopoli type inequality with the fractional one. You get fractional derivatives, full derivatives. You get L1 here, because solutions are not in L2 when you deal with measured data problems, L2 here. So this is the first lemma. So any solution satisfies this. And then the final stage is that uh, any function satisfying this fractional Cacciopoli type inequality satisfies this bound. This according, according to the orthodoxy that everything must come from standard energy estimates. And therefore, if you combine these two methods, then, uh, then you, are, you, are, you are done. And I think that this is a good point to stop. Thanks, Thanks a lot for your attention.